Hello and welcome to Navara Live. I'm Michael Walker and I'm joined on this Monday evening by James Meadway, host of the Macrodose podcast, good friend of the show. Um, James, I understand you are fresh from changing some nappies, is that correct? I am. I, you, you, I'm literally uh, recording this on the same table that, that we change nappies on, so this is really very much in situ right now. So yes. I, th- I, I thought you were going to say you are literally changing a nappy right now and that would have been incredibly impressive, but still... <laughs> Congratulations on the new baby. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, that's, it's, it's been great for three months, but changing nappy and doing this at the same time is beyond my skill set, unfortunately. Coming up tonight, loads of stories. And we talk about the really exciting election they just had in Russia. Incredibly close. Um, but it seems as if Vladimir Putin has probably just scraped through. Um, you can uh, sense the sarcasm in my voice, I hope. Um, a, a slightly closer race. Um, to lead Welsh Labour and become the first minister of Wales. And then a little bit more on the royals. Um, The Sun have had a front page that probably won't be reassuring many people nor quashing any online conspiracy theories. To which should we call them conspiracy? Online theorising. Conspiracy theories is too... um, too, uh, I I think it's assuming too much. Gaza has been under Israeli siege for almost six months. In that time, nearly 32,000 Palestinians have been killed, and the bodies of many more are fought to lie under the rubble of collapsed buildings. Until now, bombs and missiles have been the main way Israel has killed Palestinians in Gaza. But another weapon, one that might prove even more deadly, is finally attracting the attention of the international community. This was the EU's foreign affairs chief, Joseph Borrell, speaking in Brussels. In Gaza, we are no longer on on the brink of famine. We are in a state of famine, affecting thousands of people. This famine is not a a natural disaster. It's not a flood. It's not an earthquake. It's entirely man-made. By whom? That's there to say it. By whom? by the one that prevents humanitarian support entering into Gaza. The problem is that hundreds of to- trucks are waiting in the border, and the ones who control the border prevent them from coming into. I'm coming from Washington, and I, de- I dare to say, well, yes, Israel is provoking famine. This is unacceptable. The starvation is used as a weapon of war. Yes, the starvation is used as a weapon of war. Let's let's say that. Those were really, really strong words. Stronger words than I think I've heard from really any Western politician since this war began. And he is the EU's top foreign policy chief. Now, you have to think about how you know debate is moving along in Germany at the moment. Is he going to have some tough phone calls um, from the German capital? And anyway, I think very brave to say that. Hopefully, he'll be putting, on, putting pressure sorry, on, on member states in terms of sanctions. We know at the moment that pretty much... Nearly all of the Western countries are still sort of enabling this to happen. Spain have uh, sort of made some action, so have Ireland, but the vast majority of the European countries are essentially supporting what Burrell was condemning there. And those damning words came as international aid agencies warn about imminent famine in Gaza. The IPC has reported that half of Gaza's population, that's 1.1 million people, are now experiencing catastrophic hunger with famine imminent across the north of the Strip. The IPC works with the UN to set the definition of various categories of starvation and uses internationally recognised scientific standards to assess a country's food security. They report this on Gaza. The IPC acute food insecurity analysis conducted in December 2023 warned of a risk that famine may occur by the end of May 2024 if an immediate cessation of hostilities and sustained access for the provision of essential supplies and services to the population did not take place. Since then, the conditions necessary to prevent famine have not been met, and the latest evidence confirms that famine is imminent in the northern governance and projected to occur any time between mid-March and May 2024. The IPC provide this map. It shows their prediction that between now and July, the north will suffer a famine. In the same period, the entire southern portion of the strip is predicted to be in a food emergency and at risk of famine. Now, this is how the IPC defines famine. In a famine, households experience an extreme lack of food and or cannot meet other basic needs even after full employment of of coping strategies. Starvation, death, destitution 
and extremely critical acute malnutrition levels are evident. For famine classification, area needs to have extreme critical levels of acute malnutrition and mortality. So that's what they're talking about. That's what's imminent in Gaza. And already starvation conditions are in place. As you've seen, there are already people dying of starvation in Gaza, in particular children. Now, in his speech, Burrell laid the blame for this imminent humanitarian catastrophe squarely at Israel's door. But time and time again, Israel has said they're letting aid into Gaza. We have been facilitating the provision of humanitarian aid through Egypt. We want to see as much food, water, medication and shelter reach the civilians who need it while making sure that Hamas cannot steal it. We want humanitarian aid to reach the people of Gaza. We're working around the clock to make, it th to make this happen. We are working very hard to facilitate uh, humanitarian aid for the people of Gaza who have been uh, uh, relocated. They're working very, very hard, but they're still holding up lots of trucks and now we are seeing famine in Gaza, right? Responding to the IPC report, Israeli President Benjamin Netanyahu added his voice to that chorus. Our policy is to not to have famine, but to have the entry of uh, humanitarian support uh, as needed and as much as is needed. So we've allowed, we've created alternative uh, routes, supply routes. We allow the dropping of the support from the air, humanitarian aid, uh, a sea route uh, that we've cooperated with uh, and it started yesterday, uh, and alternative land routes that we're enabling again. The problem isn't getting the trucks in. The problem is that once they're getting in, they're looted by Hamas or looted by gangs. And what we're seeing, what we're trying to do with some uh, uh, other powers is to try to get the uh, aid to the actual civilians who need them and not yeah. looted by Hamas. That's well, really the problem. So it's looting by Hamas that is really the problem, according to Netanyahu. But that's not what Oxfam says. They've now released a report revealing all the ways the Israeli government is deliberately stopping aid from reaching Gazans. It's called Inflicting unprecedented suffering and destruction, and says this about Netanyahu's argument. Where Israel has allowed aid in, it has not only prevented its distribution, but used this allowance as a fig leaf to cover the obstacles to adequate delivery and to absolve itself from its own duties as an occupying power and under international humanitarian law. All parties to armed conflict hold responsibility to protect civilians and facilitate humanitarian access and must adhere to their obligations under international law, including international humanitarian law and international human rights law as applicable. Israeli allegations that Hamas is misusing and stealing aid need to be investigated. Such actions, if carried out by Hamas or any other entity, would be a condemnable violation of international humanitarian law. Yet these allegations do not absolve Israeli authorities of their own legal obligation to provide aid and to facilitate an aid effort commensurate to the critical needs of millions of people under both its occupation and its attacks. The real challenge, however, lies not merely in the allegations of diversion and looting, but in the entry of aid, its volume and what is permitted, but also in the difficulties of distribution once aid is allowed in. Now, of course, Israel controls all sea, land and air access to Gaza. And according to Oxfam, it uses complicated and heavy-handed inspection processes to stop aid getting through. Oxfam reports this on the process at the two border crossings that are currently operational. So they say, the government of Israel is imposing multi-layered inspection protocols before trucks can enter Gaza, leaving aid convoys facing mass congestion and queues. This is causing frequent delays along the line, especially on the Egypt side, which means trucks are taking on average 20 days, if not more, to move from Al-Arish to Gaza, a distance of only 40 kilometers, that's 25 miles. This has resulted in the accumulation of, at some points, 2,000 trucks lining up at the Egyptian side of the Rafah crossing. There is no apparent military justification for any of these arbitrary and onerous processes. So you can't say the problem is looting in Gaza when you are not letting trucks into Gaza, right? Oxfam also reports that Israel arbitrarily confiscates essential goods it classes as dual use. Um, so they write this, such items, including flashlights, batteries, water pipes, fittings, and medical supplies are often necessary for people's survival and for meeting other basic needs. Some items may pass one day and be rejected the next. The list of rejected items is overwhelming and ever-changing. For instance, items such as water bladders, tap stand kits, microbiological water testing kits, and chemical water quality testing kits in an Oxfam shipment were rejected, with no reason for the rejection provided. As a result of Israel's stringent controls, many items are almost never allowed to enter Gaza at all. That's completely shocking, right? So this is a shipment 
sent by Oxfam. So there'll be people donating to Oxfam, you know, because they want them to be alleviating this humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. And Israel is saying, oh, no, you can't have water testing kits, right? You can't have... That is an essential good. I mean, it's not an essential good if you're somewhere that has decent running water, but if you've got uh, an occupying power which has cut off the electricity so your water pumps aren't working properly, then you will need water testing kits so that you don't end up with you know, horrific gastrointestinal diseases, infections, right? So they are stopping the essentials getting in even when it's sent by international NGOs. There is no military justification for that. Getting aid into Gaza is also incredibly dangerous, of course, so much so that the World Food Programme has now paused their operations in the north of the Strip over fears for their staff members' safety. And UNRWA chief, Philippe Lazzarini, has confirmed that his agency hasn't been able to deliver aid to the north since late January over security concerns. Of course, it's not just that Israel is blocking aid from reaching starving Gazans. The country's international allies are standing by and allowing them to do it. That's why medical aid for Palestinians has been protesting outside the British Foreign Office today. Its CEO, Melanie Ward, spoke to Al Jazeera. It's very clear now that starvation is being used as a weapon of war. And just to give you an example, back in January, our doctors, medically for Palestinians, doctors working in one of the hospitals in Gaza, issued a statement saying that they were seeing signs of serious malnutrition amongst children. Last month, we saw data coming out showing that one in six children under the age of two in the north of Gaza were acutely malnourished. And now it's one in three children under the age of two. So the situation continues to get worse and nothing is done about it. And what's terrible is that this is a really simple problem to solve. If Israel would only let the food aid in, then we could deal with this. We could stop the starvation immediately. So Palestinians in Gaza are at imminent risk of starvation. Hunger combined with Israel continuing its ground and air offences on the territory, meanwhile, means that the population is also in increasing need of medical care. But today, Israel attacked the Al-Shifa medical complex in Gaza City for the fourth time. Before the raid began, buildings around the hospital were bombed, with heavy gunfire reported in the vicinity. IDF troops then entered the complex, with Al Jazeera journalist Wadeya Abu al-Sud sending this report from inside the hospital. We're now besieged inside Al-Shifa Hospital. We're being heavily shot at. The occupation forces suddenly raided the hospital. As you can hear now, there are intense clashes going on. We're hearing sounds coming from the gate. There is shrapnel falling all over the hospital's courtyard. An Israeli government spokesperson gave this justification for their actions. This morning, the IDF conducted a precise operation to thwart terrorism in the Shifa hospital area. Footage shows terrorists firing from deep within the Shifa complex. Our forces engaged the terrorists. Tens of Hamas terrorists have been detained in the Shifa hospital. I can now confirm that Faik Mabuchoch, head of the operations directorate of Hamas's internal security, was killed. According to the Gazan Ministry of Health, a fire has broken out at the entrance of the hospital compound. They say 30,000 people are now under siege in the hospital, including displaced women and children, the wounded and the hospital's medical staff. And they say rescue is impossible due to the IDF targeting anyone approaching the windows. Multiple civilians have also reportedly been arrested, including this man. Al Jazeera journalist Ishmael Al Ghul, who witnessed his report, was severely beaten before being dragged away by the IDF. James, I mean, as ever, a horrific reality that we're reporting on in Gaza, obviously created intentionally or otherwise by the Israelis. I mean, what seems quite new here, what seems quite striking is the strength of those words from Joseph Burrell. I was quite surprised at that. What did you make of his intervention? Yeah, it's quite dramatic. I mean, there have been a number of international agencies that, that have used similar language over the last sort of few months or so. What you've got now is a shift into uh, some of the core kind of Western institutions, including in this case, the European institutions. So it's a, it's a shift in tone, quite a striking one. Now, how far that turns into any differences in the actions of any governments connected to any of the EU institutions or, or further beyond, you know, how far that turns into Germany not supplying Israel with weapons, for example, or some of the other EU member states that are still continuing to do this uh, remains to be seen. But you can see that I think there's been a, a kind of shift and, and it's just the, the, the sheer horror of what, what's now happening, that it's not 
you know, it's not unheard of for famine to be used as a weapon of war. I mean, fairly obviously. Uh, and worse than that, you know, cases that the World Food Programme has highlighted in the last few years, as, as famine has actually worsened around the world in the last few years, after many decades of food security improving, the last few years have seen a real sort of return to food insecurity around the world, including food insecurity in, in conflict zones, uh, South Sudan, Yemen, for example, where there's an allegation, a suggestion that famine is being used quite intentionally as a way of prosecuting a war. Now, it doesn't take a lot to start to strongly suspect, and, and that's being far too generous, that this is precisely uh, what's now happening in Gaza. And it feels like a line gets crossed at this point. I mean, people will have seen the really horrifying uh, film and footage of starving children in the middle of what is a war zone. And they'll have seen some of the excuses being offered. I mean, Hamas looting, come on. This is an extraordinary thing about Hamas. One minute you're being told that the relentless onslaught by the IDF is wiping out her mass terrorists left, right, and centre. The next thing, they're capable somehow of holding up an entire international food aid operation. It, it just stretches credulity. The whole thing feels like it's got to the point where they're not that bothered about actually convincing anyone. It's just kind of filling space with something to say with a lot of these excuses. So we can all see what's going on. We've seen what's going on for a long period of time. And that kind of morality of using famine as a weapon of war, which is what appears to be taking place here, that 1.1 million people are at risk of extreme uh, food deprivation, I think is a figure uh, being offered uh, the minute. That's something that's quite shocking. That's something that creates a real sort of moral imperative at some level for, for this movement to start happening. What hasn't happened yet is a serious move diplomatically to pull the plug on, on how Israel is prosecuting this war, on the serious suggestions, I think the totally credible suggestions that what's actually happening is a genocide, and the willingness of, of Western nations and its backers to actually stop Israel doing this, to actually pull the plug, to actually take action that would have some significant consequences. It's interesting, isn't it, sort of how this is working out in terms of the geo geopolitics of, of Europe. I feel like this is something I really need to read a, a good long read on, so if you know of any, do put them in, in the comments. But you've got you know, Germany, who is sort of saying any criticism of Israel whatsoever is anti-Semitic. And, um, you you know, as, as we've reported on this show, you had a foreign minister saying, I was clapping for the for the Israeli filmmaker, not the Palestinian filmmaker. So their discourse is just completely, um, I mean, I think, frankly, racist, um, and their support for Israel unconditional. At the same time, you've got countries like Ireland and Spain who are being far more critical. And then you've got Joseph Burrell, who, you know, people often talk of him as sort of the 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 chief diplomat of the EU. So in some senses, a member of the civil service of the EU, as opposed to sort of a political actor, or at least that's the idea when it comes to the EU commission. And um, so I, I wonder, James, if you have any sort of thoughts about these splits we're potentially seeing in Europe. Is, is foreign policy vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, a situation such as Israel's war on Gaza, is the EU where the action is, or is the action in these national governments? I mean, it remains at the, the level of national government. The, the EU is this sort of slightly peculiar institution on one level, uh, grand setup, uh, lots and lots of money going into keeping lots and lots of people who, who function as civil servants with a kind of supranational ability uh, to say things and loftily declare to the world. On the other hand, ultimately, it depends on what nation states do, determines what happens inside the EU, and in particular, some of the more powerful uh, nation states, typically France and Germany, historically those two, now increasingly joined by Poland, for example. Uh, and this determines where you end up. But actually, those tensions have been there since the start. And I thought Ursula von der Leyen, uh, as a sort of president of the, the commission, uh, her earlier completely, 100%, um, totally backing Israel, no sort of hesitation about it, already provoked uh, dissent from, from EU member states. You can see that playing out already. And as it's becoming very apparent, I think, by this point, that first of all, this isn't, like, this isn't a short war. Uh, by any stretch of imagination. This isn't just a quick operation to knock out a few Hamas terrorists or whatever Israel may have sort of briefly tried to tell everyone. That clearly, this is a long haul, and not just a long haul. It is a long haul of a war on a civilian population that is now credibly, credibly accused of genocide. And I think most of the world, if you go to the global south, it's just taken as red that this is what's happening, credibly accused of genocide. And all of these Western countries, all of these Western nations who did not move rapidly to distance themselves are implicated in that. And that's a disaster for them diplomatically, because no one looks good coming out of this the other side all of a sudden. And that's a, a stain that's very, very hard to scrub out. And it's very, very hard to get you out of a situation where you've gone and given your full-throated support to a state, in this case, that's credibly accused of committing genocide. And the whole world can see it. I mean, that's something that's quite decisive here. The whole world can see it. And I think much of the world will simply not 
tolerate that happening. And you can see uh, the reaction of much of the world, the, the comparison, for example, of Olaf Scholz speaking ahead of the Malaysian prime minister that people might have caught the clip early in the week. The contrast in how different parts of the world are seeing this, the way in which the West is left, the historic countries of the West and the North are left sitting there tied into something that, that's an abomination is quite striking. So I think you're starting to see some of those tensions play out quite distinctly at the level of diplomacy. It has to turn into what nation states do to withdraw that particularly military support from Israel, because until that starts to happen, the situation on the ground doesn't fundamentally shift. And it will have to be in those those big, powerful countries, so the Germanys, the Britons, um, of course, the United States, that goes without saying. And I, I'm sure there are sort of many PhDs written about this, about sort of does it affect a commissioner's politics, which country they have come from? Because obviously, you know, it's a, a multinational um, civil service. And Josep Borrell from Spain, Spain has been relatively progressive on this. He's been relatively progressive on this. Ursula von der Leyen from Germany, which has been, you know, incredibly, I mean, reactionary and appalling um, on, on this conflict. And she has really been somewhat reactionary and appalling throughout most of it. So, you know, maybe an interesting case study in, in, in that respect. Hopefully the Burrells um, will get their way over the Bond Alliance when it comes to this question. In a dramatic and close-run election, Vladimir Putin has been re-elected with 87% of the vote. His closest rival got just over 4%. This is how the BBC reported on Putin's victory speech. For Vladimir Putin, six more years in the Kremlin. Russia's president is sounding more confident than ever. Whoever might want to intimidate us, whoever might want to suppress us, our will and our conscience, they have never been able to do it and never will. Then, Mr Putin's first public comments on the death of jailed opposition leader Alexei Navalny. You may be surprised, but a few days before Mr Navalny died, some colleagues of mine told me there was an idea to exchange him for certain people in prison in the West. You can believe it or not. I said, I agree, even before he'd finished talking. But what happened, happened. Alexei Navalny was, of course, Russia's most important opposition leader until last month when he died under incredibly suspicious circumstances in a Siberian prison. And that's left Putin with supposed opponents who are much more accommodating to him. His three presidential rivals stood with him at a rally today, which was held to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of Russia's unilateral annexation of Crimea. I will always remember that feeling of uh, pride for my country and for my president exactly 10 years ago, and I congratulate you. I congratulate you on this event. All glory to Russia. A defeated candidate introducing their opponent in such warm tones might in another context be considered a sign of civility in politics, people accepting um, defeat in a sort of noble way. The reality in this instance is, of course, much, much darker. Any candidate that doesn't fawn over Putin risks getting killed. At the rally, Putin also spoke of the Donbass and other occupied areas of Ukraine as the new Russia and said that a new rail link is being built through the region, so sort of trying to change facts on the ground um, so that parts of Ukraine become parts of Russia. Earlier today, I spoke to Ilya Butrytskis. Um, he's a political theorist and activist from Russia who is currently based in Berkeley, California. It's important to explain how these elections are organized. Many uh, workplaces, like especially in the public sector, uh, at schools, at hospitals, police, uh, and various uh, various places in the in the public sector, as well as in the big corporations, uh, in some indirect way, controlled by by the state. Uh, you uh, you must vote if you want to keep your uh, your job. If you want to continue to to work there, uh, you uh, you have to uh, you have to vote, and uh, that is very much controlled 
in, in uh, especially in these elections. So it was always like this, but these elections is especially controlled. So you should uh, report uh, to your uh, boss uh, that you uh, the, the, that you voted. Another thing is that you have a so-called electronic vote, so you can vote online. Uh, in in Russia, and many people uh, also in uh, in uh, in their workplaces, uh, they were forced to work uh, online uh, on their workplaces under the control of their uh, bosses. And it's important that for uh, online vote, uh, of course, you you have to provide all your personal data to the state. So it means that. Your vote is like totally uh, is totally controlled. Uh, so uh, in this atmosphere, uh, people um, uh, feel that their um, uh, that their uh, let's say choice on these uh, elections uh, is very much uh, is very much controlled. That these elections is not about their free choice, but it's about the test for <coughs> uh, loyalty. Uh, and uh, that's how the, the most of Russians, how they, they perceived uh, these elections. You have to vote in a certain way in uh, order to continue your lifestyle, in order to save your um, workplace and so on. The other uh, element of these uh, elections is that uh, Putin is in power for uh, almost 25 years. For many people, he is the only imaginable. Uh, the only imaginable leader <clears throat> of the country. And uh, in this sense, uh, for many people, uh, there is no any, uh, even the idea that uh, it could be uh, any alternative to, uh, to Putin. So that's why they, they could uh, vote for Putin uh, in, uh, in order to prevent uh, some some sort of worst scenario, because the main uh, thing that Putin is uh, selling basically it's a, it's a fear, and it's a fear that uh, if he will disappear, uh, if we'll have no more uh, Putin as a leader of the country, there will be chaos, uh, there will be invasion of uh, NATO, uh, there will be a civil war, uh, there will be. I don't know, some catastrophes coming. So the only way to <clears throat> prevent this coming catastrophe is to uh, support Putin. What should we make of him mentioning Navalny sort of in his victory speech? And he said that he, he had agreed essentially the day before Navalny died that Navalny could be released in a prison swap. I mean, how do you interpret that? Why has he, he brought up this? Why has he spoken publicly about Navalny for the first time? Putin, uh, uh, his main uh, like uh, imaginary, uh, let's say, uh, opponent is always uh, the some sort of collective West. So he is always addressing to collective West, uh, but not uh, for Russian people or or for Western voters. Uh, he is addressing to some hidden uh, collective uh, leadership of the of the West. And uh, this message is, uh, was also the message of this kind. He said that um, Navalny unfortunately died in prison, which meant basically that he uh, he confessed that he was involved in this uh, in this murder, like in a very open way, and uh, that was the some sort of signal uh, for for this imaginary collective uh, collective best uh, that uh, he uh, he's absolutely uh, free to do such things uh, that there are no uh, restraints for him to to kill his opponents inside the country or abroad so i i read this message in this way what do we know at this point about russian people's opinions on the war in Ukraine. There were hopes um, in the West, especially, that at some point sort of fatigue um, would set in when it comes to people's um, views on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Are we seeing any of that? Russia for the moment is uh, is the very 
very repressive uh, dictatorship. So the level of repressions in current Russia is much higher uh, than uh, it was in in the, in the most of Soviet uh, period after uh, Stalin. Two times more political prisoners in Russia than in the times of of Brezhnev in the in the late uh, Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, of course uh, people are are very afraid. You could be jailed uh, just for very simple uh, like expression of your uh, anti-war or uh, anti-regime feelings. So in such situation, any public opposition is uh, uh, it's, it's a very serious choice. Uh, and uh, even in this situation, we saw uh, thousands of people in the funeral of uh, Navalny in, in Moscow. And there were a lot of people who came uh, to this uh, silent protest uh, during the elections in the in the afternoon of um, of uh, in, in in Sunday uh, Sunday afternoon. So uh, basically, we see that the anti-war uh, sentiments are growing in Russia, but you have to be very uh, brave to express it publicly in any way. Uh, because it could uh, lead to the criminal punishment. Uh, so uh, in this way, I, I think that the reason why Putin decided to <clears throat> announce that he got uh, 87% of the vote, it's uh, exactly to show that uh, he represents uh, the uh, absolute majority. And actually just uh, uh, two weeks before the selection, uh, he said that the so-called special military operation uh, is supported by absolutely majority of, of Russians. And then in two weeks, you had the elections, uh, which absolutely proved that uh, Putin was right. He wants to create uh, this idea that if you are uh, against the war, you are marginal, uh, your voice is, is not important, you have some sort of absolute total majority uh, against you. The open opposition to the war uh, now in Russia is is, is very big choice, is, is very serious choice. But also you can say that the uh, anti-war sentiments, uh, the uh, hopes uh, for uh, for uh, some peace uh, from the side, uh, from the, coming from the uh, side of Russia, are very much uh, growing in the uh, in the Russian society. That was Ilya Butrytsky speaking to me earlier today. Um, now I want to discuss some of the economics um, related to Russia and Ukraine with James, because there have been some unpleasant surprises for the West when it comes to the sanctions regime placed on Russia back in twenty twenty two. Now the first as represented by this Financial Times headline from about a month ago, is the surprising resilience of the Russian economy in the face of sanctions. Last year, the Russian economy grew by 3% faster than the rest of the G7. And it's projected by the IMF to have growth of 2.6% next year. Of course, that's in part because they had a fall um, in 2022. And so it's a bit of a bounce back, but it's not a it's not a, an economy that's struggling in the way that the people who designed those sanctions would have hoped and on the other hand, the sanctions do appear to be having a considerable impact on many Western nations, in particular Germany. A new study by two German economists has found that the energy price shock in 2022 led to wages falling further, in any, further than in any year since 1950 in Germany. The report by Isabella Weber and Tom Krebs found that real wages fell by 4% and output by 4.1% compared to pre crisis forecasts. And Weber connects this to the rise in support for the far-right alternative for Deutschland party. So she says this, in an age of conflict, climate and geopolitical crisis, the rise of the AFD is a wake-up call. The collapse in living standards experienced by Germans is unprecedented since World War II. While it is true that the factors that fueled the rise of the AFD go beyond economics, it is also impossible to ignore how this unprecedented slump in German living went hand in hand with the rising popularity of the far right. James, I want your your thoughts on this, I suppose. Many people will be saying, oh, the sanctions have backfired. Russia has managed to 
um, weather them, whereas Europe or the rest of Europe, Western Europe, is 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 bearing much of the cost of them. What's your take? Well, they're, they're kind of right if they're saying this. I mean, look, the, the sanctions are based on a, as it turns out, a, a pretty dramatic overestimate of the capacity of, of that group of Western allied nations centered on the US to turn globalization against the country, to kind of turn globalization off, to pull the plug on a financial system. The, the central bank of Russia was subject to sanctions from February 2022 onwards. I mean, this is not quite unprecedented, but it's, it's very, very dramatic to say you're literally the most important bank, the most important financial institution in your country is now going to be unable to perform basic things like can it access its foreign exchange reserves, you know, things like this. Um, Russian institutions were cut off from the systems that allow money to transfer across borders internationally. Uh, there, there was a severe set of very dramatic restrictions placed on Russia, which did have a shock initially. And then I think, first of all, I think the Russian elite were, were entirely sort of prepared for this to happen. They were expecting that Russia had been building up reserves and, and coming up with alternative uh, supply chains, at least since 2014. You can sort of see the figures on this. You can see how they were diverting the economy away from a Western orientation and looking for alternative places to, for instance, sell oil and gas to, um, that the actions of the central bank in Russia appears to be well prepared for what was coming. They've quickly been able to build up alternative financial systems. They've been able to quickly go to China and notably to India as alternative sources to trade oil and gas, uh, to buy products from, to keep the economy ticking over, to allow consumer spending to continue, to insulate Russian population to some extent from, from the, the, the impacts of the sanctions. So the big marker here is that the age in which globalization centered on what was happening in Washington, New York in particular, I think is kind of over. That power that once upon a time Washington might have had over a globalized system no longer exists. And, and what's happened in Russia is a demonstration of that. It's a demonstration really to the rest of the world that you might not want to be part of that big global dollar-centered system anymore. You might want to look for alternative ways of doing business that are not subject to America suddenly deciding they're going to try and turn it off, or America's allies suddenly trying to turn it off. So I think this has been a powerful driver out of globalization everywhere. And also, of course, the direct consequences of this is exactly as people have pointed out, Isabella Weber and her colleagues have pointed out, that what's happened in Russia, yes, it's a shock, but also there's a shock in Europe as well, particularly in Germany, which become very, very dependent on relatively cheap German energy, uh, Russian energy for a long, long period of time over the decade beforehand. It's been a real shock there. It's been a shock felt across the, the rest of the continent. This has not played out as was anticipated back in February 2022. Two ways that this has sort of really backfired. Well, I, I, I'm going to withhold judgment. I think there was a good moral justification for sanctions and my sort of economic expertise is not strong enough to sort of come down strongly on one side or, or the other. I know also that FT piece did say that, you know, potentially um, the Russian growth figures are decent because the state is spending lots of money on arms manufacturing and it it could all sort of crumble. Um, you know, there's an argument that this isn't sort of real growth based on innovation and productivity, but more sort of just the state throwing money at the arms industry. So I'm going to withhold judgment on that. But in terms of how this seems to have backfired on the West, there's this increased oil prices and gas prices, especially in, in Europe, which potentially is going to turn our politics in a bit of a dark direction in Germany, at least. That's a suggestion from Isabella Weber. And then also, as you've said, uh, this sort of loss of credibility of Western financial institutions, because any country now knows, well, if you hold your foreign reserves in the Federal Reserve of the United States or in the Bank of England, it might just get stolen from you, essentially, the moment you take a, an action in foreign policy that those Western powers don't like. So I think that you know the UK are currently talking about um, essentially um, confiscating, no, because up to now they've frozen the reserves of 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 the Russians in foreign or in Western central banks. Now they want to confiscate it and use it to buy arms for Ukraine. Was the latest sort of plan I heard, which I mean would be very that's that's a reason not to invest in those Western institutions if you want to have a foreign policy which isn't um, allied to them. I suppose very quickly though, James, is, does this mean that sanctions are a bit pointless now for for Western countries, or can we only sanction very small countries? Not that we would want to. I, I think the sanctions on Iran are unjustifiable, but yeah. they've been effective to some degree. It, 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 has this shown that we, you know, a sanctions regime just doesn't really have that much effect if you're doing it to, to a, a reasonably large power? Well, it's certainly starting to look like that. I mean, look, you can make a, a moral case for, for imposing the sanctions. But the question you have to ask is whether these things will work as intended. And actually, the, the blowback from this 
is that this is an acceleration. And we're a long way from like the dollar isn't, isn't going to be the, the top currency in the world. I mean, it still is by really quite a long way. But this is accelerating something that was already happening, which is a lot of places, not even ones that are sort of overtly hostile to Washington, but suddenly starting to think, actually, this is not the be all and end all of how we're going to trade forevermore. This is not that we're going to just, for instance, have the dollar used uh, for the majority of the world's trade that takes place. And the dollar uses what you have to buy your oil in. I mean, you notice Saudi Arabia, for example, a long standing US ally making noises last year that it would now start to accept other cu currencies than the dollar to sell its oil. Now, that's quite a big thing. I mean, and there are big places out there, China most obviously, that have their own currency, that are looking potentially for trade. They are looking for trading partners around the rest of the world. And there's lots of other sort of middle income countries in a similar kind of position. So that's the blowback from this. Sanctions implemented even by quite a tightly knit group of countries, as happened in February 2022, centered on the US, some of its close allies, theoretically large, powerful uh, economies, theoretically ones that have significant command over the financial system, actually hasn't played out as they might have anticipated. It's a real marker for where the world is heading. This isn't a, a unipolar world anymore. Not by a long way, actually. We're heading into something that looks more like a, a multipolar world, a one where there are several different centers and sources of power. And that means that if you're trying to run sanctions against someone that's not entirely within your orbit, it may not work as effectively as you, might, as you might have wished. The Welsh Labour Party has elected a new leader, meaning that Wales will have a new first minister later this week. Welsh Minister for the Economy Vaughan Geffing won nearly 52% of the vote on Saturday, beating closest rival Education Minister Jeremy Miles to the leadership. And when Geffing becomes First Minister, he'll not only be the first black leader of Wales, he'll also be the first black leader of any European nation. Geffing said this after his victory was announced. Today, we turn a page in the book of our nation's history. A history that we write together. Not just because I have the honour of becoming the first black leader in any European country, but because the generational dial has jumped too. Like Ken and Jane, devolution is not something that I have had to get used to or to adapt to or to apologise for. The Welsh Labour leadership contest came about following the resignation of First Minister Mark Drakeford in December. Geffing ran his campaign on a platform that included a promise to deal with the impact of the cost of living crisis on Wales, as well as to reform its battling health and education systems. And on the prospect of a general election around the corner, Geffing said this. I know that we can win the next general election. We can win so that young people no longer feel weighed down by a UK government that has no interest in their future. We can win so that neighbours are not pitted against each other, exhausted by culture wars. We can win so that Wales can take its place at the frontier of a green jobs revolution that fuels new ambition and expands horizons. We can win if we stand together, linking arms to repeat the narrow forces of division that seek to make a warm nation turn cold. That only happens if we sweep the Tories out of office and send Keir Starmer into number 10. Born in Zambia, Geffing is the son of a Welsh vet and a Zambian chicken farmer, though his family moved to Wales when he was just two years old. He joined the Labour Party at the age of 17, inspired by articles he read about Nelson Mandela while doing his newspaper delivery round. Um, he then studied at Aberystwyth and Cardiff Universities, becoming the youngest member of the National Union of Students um, in Wales before training to be a lawyer. In 2013, he made history by becoming the first black minister in any of the devolved nations. He then rose up through the Welsh government, serving as a health minister and most recently the economy minister. Now, this could all be viewed as an inspiring story, a path to power, um, but Geffing's path to power hasn't been without controversy. Weeks before the leadership ballot, it was revealed that Geffing had lobbied regulators on behalf of Atlantic Recycling. That's a company that had been prosecuted for waste crimes and which later gave £200,000 to his leadership campaign. 
In 2013, Atlantic Recycling was prosecuted for illegally dumping waste, and in 2017, they were prosecuted again for failing to clean it up. That cost its owner, David Neal, £250,000 in fines and costs, as well as two suspended sentences. In 2016, Geffing wrote a letter to Welsh environmental regulator Natural Resources Wales, raising concerns about public money being spent on a dispute with Atlantic Recycling. Um, In 2018, Geffing wrote a second letter criticising the agency for taking too long to grant Atlantic Recycling a permit. Later that year, companies linked to David Neal gave £38,000 to a previous leadership campaign of Geffing's, and in the last three months, another company linked to Neal gave Geffing's latest campaign a further £200,000. Commenting on the story, um, Geffing's office said this... It is routine practice for members of the Senate, including government ministers, to correspond with a range of public bodies regarding constituency issues. This is an important function of elected representatives, especially when jobs are at risk. In his role as a constituency MS, Vaughan engaged with both Atlantic Recycling and NRW. So it's National Recycling Wales, isn't it? All donations are declared to the Senef and Electoral Commission in line with the rules and Vaughan's commitment to transparency. It is a matter of public record that ministers are not able to take decisions on matters that are specific to their constituency in line with the ministerial code. Natural Resources Wales said that Geffing's correspondence had no impact on their decision-making, adding that, quote, receiving correspondence from elected representatives is not uncommon. But others think it's not a great start. This was the leader of Plaid Cymru on that controversy. I've made it very clear um, that it doesn't feel right, does it? There's a a perception issue around this this money. Vaughan Gething and the outgoing First Minister says they have uh, considered very carefully and no rules were broken here, but it's more about more than just the rules, isn't it? Uh, It doesn't doesn't feel right. And and one way to clear that up would be to pay the money back, pay to an environmental charity. Why not? My relationship will be to hold him to account on one hand, firmly, and on the other hand, to offer that alternative vision. Because I I know that uh, that this isn't as good as things can get for Wales. And when I talk about building a fairer, more ambitious future for Wales, I will do that every day in holding the government to account with a new First Minister uh, and uh, and in the work that I do within Plaid Cymru and the length and breadth of Wales, talking to people about how things could be pretty different if we had a different kind of government. Now, James, the thing that I always find somewhat entertaining is not quite the right word, but curious, let's say, about these controversies when it comes to British politics, is the sums are always so small that you kind of think, why did you need to do that? So, you know, when it comes to the Conservatives, we've obviously got this, you know, very justifiable controversy about this donor who said some horrific racist things about Diane Abbott. But another part of that story is the guy who's given £5 million to the Conservatives or £10 million, whatever it is, he also gets public contracts to and, and makes loads of money off the NHS. So it just seems like that sounds dodgy. This thing with Vaughan Geffing sounds dodgy. I mean, I don't know the details of it. He's saying there's there's been no wrongdoing happening here. But it does seem that you've got lots of politicians accepting sums of money from people who make money from the state or who can gain favours from the state. Um, and they're often not huge amounts, but it just makes everyone look a bit more cynical than perhaps you know we would want our politicians to look. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the, the sums involved are tiny. I mean, if you want real like, stacks of cash, you go and have a look at the US and the, there's vast sums of money that are handed over through various routes by corporations to politicians. I mean, just the sheer expense and scale of it, it, it makes Britain look very toy town indeed in these things. It's always quite striking that, you know, some, somebody paid, you know, was it £20,000 to go for dinner with the Prime Minister and a bit later they get these whacking great contracts and this sort of thing, or you have to run a pub next door to Matt Hancock. You know, sort of big list of uh, sometimes fairly random, uh, fairly cheap, fairly low level things that you have to do to actually sort of bend British politics, or at least give the impression of bending British politics uh, in your direction. Uh, it is the problem, the impression here, which is exactly as the Blyde leader uh, picks up on, uh, is the issue. Whatever you know, everyone's going to say about there is no connection, the rest of it. Everybody out there is going to see this and say it certainly looks as if there might be a connection. That's enough for me to think that there's something iffy going on. And Plaid will be all over this. I, I, you know, it's not just they would detect an opportunity uh, on this specific issue. It's also that actually, let's say Labour does win the election, general election, due later this year. Almost certainly, and almost certainly, Labour will win. And that's a kind of problem for a Labour Party in Wales that has 
done really quite nicely under Mark Drayford and under previous uh, leaders in saying, well, we're here to protect you from this terrible Tory government in, in Westminster. Now, you know, if you go back far enough, you find people like Rodri Morgan, the first leader, uh, first minister, the first first minister of Wales just after devolution came in, came in, who was always like clear red water between ourselves and the Labour uh, government in Westminster. We are being different. We are a Welsh Labour Party. We are not the same as this one. But it's a hard task to do. And if you look at what uh, Vaughan Getting was just talking about, ah, well, if we get Keir Starmer elected, all of this is going to look better. Now, if I was plied, I'll be sitting there thinking, well, there's a couple of things here. First of all, Labour are going to win and they're promising absolutely knack all. Let's be clear about that. At the minute, Labour is saying we're going to, they don't like to talk about it, but they're basically saying we're going to continue with Tory austerity. They've said, not said they're going to reverse this. They're not going to end it. It's more austerity under Labour. So that happens. And by the way, just over now a few years, Welsh independence has gone from very much kind of minority pursuit to something that's starting to get quite serious polling support. Now, if you apply Cymru sitting there looking at a situation like this, you will sniff an opportunity. And I think they're going to make hay out of this and they're going to make a real push in particular if Labour win the next election due later this year. Rumours are still in overdrive as to what exactly is going on in the House of Windsor. The Princess of Wales has not been seen since Christmas publicly. Well, at least that was the case until this weekend. The Sun splashed their Monday edition with the headline, Kate Outdoors. There's a big picture of Kate Middleton looking happy and healthy, and it says in big bullet points, Kate seen out with William at farm, and first public trip ends web rumours. But this front page didn't end web rumours, and for good reason. That's because the photo splashed across the front of the sun doesn't show Kate this weekend, but rather last autumn. And the only people quoted in the story are unnamed onlookers. The Sun still thinks it's a pretty big scoop, though, and they sent a crack team of reporters down to the farm shop in Windsor. We're here outside the Windsor farm shop, where on Saturday the Prince and Princess of Wales were seen together uh, getting some shopping. They were seen by onlookers who described them as happy uh, and said Kate in particular was looking very healthy. It's obviously the first time Kate has properly been seen in public since Christmas Day. She's been out of action uh, after she underwent some abdominal surgery. The Kensington Palace said that she'd be out uh, until after Easter, but in recent weeks there's been wild speculation and conspiracies online about Kate's health, where she is. And so Onlookers said their, their outing today really put those rumours to bed. Now, the Sun seems to have taken upon itself the task of quashing any probing questions about Kate. Mid speculation following the release of a clearly photoshopped family picture, the Sun told social media users to lay off Kate. They accused those questioning the official narrative um, about Kate and Will of bullying, um, and they said their theories were absurd. But not all the Tory tabloids have been so defensive. The Daily Mail splashed its Saturday front page with a warning to the Windsors, stating, if the royal family is not quite at the 11th hour, it is perilously close. In the piece, Richard Kay lists a number of royal mishaps from the past few weeks and months, and then says this. Charles' own condition has unavoidably focused attention on his and Camilla's long-term position. The king will be 76 this year, and his reign will naturally not have the longevity of his late mother's. On the other hand, William, with Kate all being well, will likely be on the throne for decades. It therefore poses a question. What can they do today to give us confidence that they will be anywhere near as effective as monarch and consort as the Queen and Prince Philip were? Can they steady the royal ship, even in the squalls and storms of social media comment and untamed foreign reporting? Now, I like that tacit admission in a British newspaper that the British media are tamed when it comes to royal reporting. So, can, you know, obviously we're not going to make life difficult for them, but foreign reporters and the foreign press, they're not tamed like us, and that could be difficult. I know people got so many people have got so far down this particular rabbit hole, and there, there are so many different crazy parts of the story. The, the guy who was found, you know, killed with a gun next to him a few weeks ago. There's, uh, there's any number of, of, of different angles to take in this, but, but the uh, Daily Mail front page did summarise something actually probably quite important here, which is that, yes, this is, could well be the 11th hour. It does have that creaking failure aspect to it, whatever the probably fairly mundane uh, real story is underneath all of this. The fact they're managing it so badly, the fact it just looks like wheels coming off all over the place, so many things going wrong from what used to be this ferociously you know, media savvy, particularly after, once they sort themselves after 
Princess Diana's death, ferociously media savvy, aggressive, you know, the firm, as it gets called, uh, media savvy, aggressive, on top of anybody saying anything bad about them, you don't mess with the royal family. That just doesn't seem to be happening anymore. And that, I think, is quite a decisive moment for them because it's not just like this is a bit of a whatever the, whatever the hell's going on with, with Kate Middleton and all the rest of them. It's not just this story. It's this long-standing decline in support and deference to the royal family, particularly uh, for younger people in Britain. And that's something that none of this is going to help re- recover. So fingers crossed it is the 11th hour. I'll be very happy to see an English republic established in the wake of this sort of half-assed, you know, royal family and constitutional monarch and all the other nonsense we should have got rid of in the 17th century, but unaccountably failed to do so. I was speaking to someone on the weekend who sort of said they were very disappointed in Navarro because they've been reading all of these explosive theories online about um, Will and Kay, about their relationship, about their future, et cetera, et cetera. Why aren't we reporting it? And the reason is because I'm still trying to work out the legality of all of this. Because the thing I can't work out is, is the reason that foreign newspapers are reporting on this, but British newspapers aren't, is because we'll all get sued? Or is it because of deference to the royal family? Now, we have no deference to the royal family. But if we were to go bankrupt because we uh, reported a story about Kate Middleton, I'm not sure that would be a good use of all of your funds. Um, Which leads me to say, Navarro Media is... Uh, funded by our viewers, by our readers, by our supporters. If you are not already a Navarro Media supporter, please do go to navarromedia.com forward slash support. I will try and find how find out how, how much you know grittier we can get in our coverage of the Royals, but I promise I will not blow your subscription fees on a battle um, with Kensington Palace. Um, thank you, James, for joining me tonight. No problem at all. Glad to be here again. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. Make sure to come back tomorrow for another stream. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.